Hello, dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome to How Should I Treat Bifurcation Stenosis webinar on provisional strategy as a treatment philosophy in my CAT lab. My name is Goran Stanković. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Belgrade, Serbia, and it's my pleasure and privilege to run this webinar with two colleagues and friends, Dr. David Hildig smith from UK and Professor Jens Lassen from Denmark. Our topic today is provisional as a philosophy in the lab, because there is a lot of misunderstanding what is a provisional strategy and how should we apply it in our everyday work. Can I have the first slide? So objectives of today's webinars are the following. We will try to discuss and share understanding and rationale behind stepwise decision-making in provisional strategy. We'll try to learn and discuss the steps of provisional bifurcation PCI as it is recommended in 2020, and discuss different stent optimization techniques as well as some pitfalls that we may expect. And try also to understand if provisional strategy is single stent or there is some more behind. So I would like to ask Dave to show one typical case from his experience from his cat lab. Dave, floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Goran. It's my pleasure. Um, so I'm going to show a, a standard case of uh, the kind of situation which is very commonplace in our cat lab and many others. And this case is of a... 68-year-old man who's an academic. Actually, he helped set up the medical school where I work, and he had had chest pain on exertion. Uh, he had a positive family history of ischemic heart disease, and therefore it was decided that he should go forward for an angiogram. So far, so uncontentious. And um, his angiogram, as you can see here on the right coronary artery, shows a minor uh, restriction perhaps in the mid part of the vessel, but the key problem is here in the LAD where there's a bifurcation with a sizable diagonal. Uh, there is of interest a small, more proximal diagonal, which I think you'd agree is slightly smaller than this second diagonal, but that may be relevant to our discussion. Um, so that's the setup of the case. Perhaps I could hand back to Goran for a moment to discuss the key principles of uh, bifurcation PCI. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. Maybe it's better if we go backwards just to show our audience again uh, one back and then one forward in order to, uh, to run the videos. Go one slide back and then uh, again one forward. Now one, okay, so now it will run. And uh, in every cat lab, we frequently see cases like this one with large plug burden, with significant stenosis in both proximal and distal segment of the main vessel, as well as in the ostium of a relevant side branch. So the main question is, what is the risk of losing the territory of the side branch? and how to prevent that one. Uh, when we speak about provisional, provisional for European Bifurcation Club is a strategy and makes difference compared to technique. For example, when we say DK crush, it's a technique of two stand strategy, starting with the side branch stenting first and then stenting the main vessel. However, one of the inventors of the provisional as a philosophy or strategy is uh, our philosopher, Professor Jens Lassen, who actually set up the steps of provisional as a physio uh, philosophy in his consensus documents. So Jens, uh, maybe you should uh, describe the steps of provisional if this is the case for provisional. What do you think? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Goran. Uh, and, and, and David, it's an excellent case. Uh, I guess every operator will actually like to protect that side branch and be afraid of losing it. So this is, uh, this is actually the decision-making uh, thing you need to be aware of. It's also quite obvious that this, uh, this bifurcation is a true bifurcation. There's, uh, there's sickness in proximal and distal part of the main branch and in the 
in the, in, in the austere area of the side brands. So this is actually a, a case where we would use two wires, but maybe we should have the next slide because that depicts actually some of the steps that uh, we like to push forward as the philosophy of, of uh, stenting. First of all, we say keep it simple and safe, which means if you go for two stents up front, you will always end with two stents in the bifurcation, and then it changed from simple to complex. If you go with one stent and move forward in a stepwise fashion, you can end with two stents if needed, but only if needed. And that made it actually possible to stop at each stent during the uh, step during the procedure. That would limit the numbers of stents because sometimes it's possible, most times it's possible. The next step is actually to respect the original bifurcation anatomy and try to reproduce it. And we will come back to that uh, in a moment. But the, but the biology is really important here. And of course, we also need to aim for well-opposed and well-expanded stents with limited overlap to reduce the risk of late uh, events. So this is the principle behind keep it simple, try to avoid too many uh, stents and move forward in a stepwise fashion. The risk of this uh, philosophy is actually to lose the side brands during the procedure, which means that if you go for this, you have to protect the side brands with a wire and you need to have in your toolbox uh, tools to save the side brands if it closes during the procedure. But we will also address that in a bit. So next slide, please. This is actually the rationale behind the biology. This picture is a vessel, and it depicts some of the uh, relations between the diameter and the proximal and distal parts of a bifurcation. It's totally intuitive that the amount, the amount of blood running in in the proximal part would be exactly the same amount which will come out in the two distal parts if we collect them in the same uh, uh, bottle. So this is actually the principle of mass uh, conservation. But the diameter is not the same. And, and this is actually the fractal manner of the division of a, of a, a, a coronary artery. And what does that mean in, in, in respect of stenting uh, therapy? So th this is actually the main important thing because the distal diameter of the main brands is smaller than the proximal diameter. And the stent we use for treatment is tubular, which means they have the same diameter in the proximal part and the distal part. So if we implant a stent with respect to the proximal diameter, it will be overdilated in the distal part across the side brands. And, the, and, and two things will happen by nature and as a consequence. First of all, we'll push the carina towards the side brands and maybe also push plaque burden towards the side brands. The other thing that will happen is an overstretchment of the vessel wall which will make uh, the, uh, the side brands ostium oval and narrow. So this is actually a thing that is very important to be aware of. So if we go further on to the next slide, please. This is from the, the latest uh, uh, paper, uh, or the second latest paper from the European Bifurcation Club and depicting the different steps in how to transform a tubular stent in a bifurcation to a stent that actually fits the biology. And this is the true important thing behind the provisional philosophy. Make a tubular stent tapered and make it fit the biology. And what we do is introducing a proximal ballooning with a shorter balloon called the proximal optimization technique, as you can see uh, on top in this cartoon, because this corrects the proximal part of the stent, uh, which is underdilated because we have implanted the stent with respect to the distal uh, diameter in order to avoid the overstretching and the pushing of the carina and the closing of the side brands. By doing it this way, we actually achieve two things. We have a velopost stent in the proximal part, but we also actually organize the stent struts for towards the side brands in a way that makes wiring much more easy than if we wire in through an overstretch stent 
with an oval or a fissure. Next step is actually rewire, basically as close to the carina tip or distal as possible to make a total correction of the proximal stent stops up in the roof when we open it up. Do a kissing balloon inflation, and then after that, finalize with a proximal balloon uh, dilatation, a, a second pot. And by this time, try to make it precisely uh, to the edge of the stent to avoid what we could call bottleneck or under deployment in the, in the, in the, the, uh, the top crown of the stent. So this is actually how to make that scaffold, which is a single stent technique, and maybe, and most often, this is sufficient to treat even a very complex bifurcation. But if not, next yeah. slide, please. If not, the next slide, please. Hello? Could we have yeah, the next maybe. slide, please? Well, yeah, this is a, a uh, this is a running video from the Visible Heart Laboratory in Minneapolis. Uh, it, this is an angioscope, and it sh shows us very, very easily what is the problems when we uh, actually have implanted the stent with respect to the distal diameter and go for the proximal uh, uh, diameter. If we don't do the part, it's very easy to go behind the stent struts and actually hamper the, the stent geography. But again, coming back to the initial scaffolding, which was finalized with a kissing. Next slide, please. Because here I would like to discuss with, with both of you again. This is actually a cartoon showing us what happens when the first stent is implanted. Then we can open up to the side brands. And in the end, if we need to move forward, it's not a bailout situation. It's just by decision making because we would like to use two stents. And having done the first of the, the work in a proper way, it's most often not needed with a second stent. But if it is, there are possibilities, the T-tap and culotte. But I think maybe I would like to hear a bit of, of, of your comments on the, this uh, also, Goran and, and, and Dave. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jens. This was really very educational, very didactic presentation. And thanks to illustrations which were prepared by Francesco Burzotta and his team, we can really uh, share with our community step-by-step -step performance of provisional. Uh, we received in the meantime several questions. And before we move into the procedure, I will ask a couple of questions to both of you. So please uh, prefer uh, uh, which one you would like to answer. So, uh, when we saw basic anatomy, question is, would anybody consider CABG for this case? Who wants to answer? Nope. No. I mean, no. Not really. I mean, not really. It's, not, it's not totally unreasonable, but a single uh, lesion in the LAD diagonal bifurcation should be very manageable with a stent, you know, bypass as a last resort, really. Exactly. I fully agree with you. Next question is, uh, if side branch is small, then it's provisional. If it's BC, like 3535, but this refers to paper by Prof. Ludwig and Mamas Mamas and ABC classification for this the left main, uh, if uh, both branches are large, then uh, our colleague suggested two stand technique up front. Uh, so, we... so I'm I'm going to comment on that. So sorry for hogging it, okay. but uh, you know we did the EBC two study, which is uh, under recognised and under reported in a sense, where we looked at 200 patients who had large side branches, two and a half millimeters diameter or larger, with five millimeters of uh, uh, of length of lesion disease of the osteoid side branch, and actually we didn't see any difference at one year between the uh, two stent and the provisional techniques. And in fact, Jens will be reporting the five-year outcomes on that study in due course. But uh, I don't think that means you need to decide up front to have a two stent strategy just because the branches are big. The provisional approach is just as applicable in that circumstance, I would suggest. I don't know, Jens, if you have any comments on that well uh, yes yes i do uh, because it comes back to what i was saying before 
this this could be a two stand technique, but if you do it up front, you will end with two stand, and then it will be complex. If you do it provisional, you may end with two stand if needed, but you can't stop on the way. So if uh, if you embark up front on a two stand technique, there should be really really good reason for doing it. And if it's just because you can, it's in my opinion a very very poor reason. Exactly. I, I agree completely with that one because we try to promote provisional as a stepwise strategy with multiple layers of complexity, which we are adding if necessary. And if we exhaust all possibilities on level one, then we go to the next level, to the next level. And of course, the option to put seconds and is viable throughout the case, unless uh, we really have dissection and compromise of the flow in the side branch. In that case, we speak about bailout stenting. All other situations are step-by-step -step provisional with plan to stand strategy. And what you showed, Jens, as the last slide, we can always select according to anatomy and personal preference and bifurcation angle to do T, tap, or culotte as a choice. There was also a choice of internal crash but because of only a few anecdotal reports, I think that solution is not really widely used. One practical question from our colleagues also, can I use different company stands for bifurcation? Go for it. Definitely. Another strategy that is, I think, we, people speak a lot about image guidance, but I would like to, mm. uh, to hear your opinion, uh, how often do you consider imaging IVUS in non-left main stand bifurcation stenting? So personally, I, I don't use it very much, but I think uh, increasingly the evidence suggests that where it's used and interpreted wisely, probably the outcomes are better. There are probably cases where an inadequate uh, job is done without using the intravascular ultrasound. Of course, there's the October study going on at the moment, which is looking at this in more detail. Um, but I think so long as you become proficient at the use of intravascular imaging, there's no harm probably in doing it. Yes, you may take up a little more time, a little more contrast, a little more passage of uh, material. So always a slight risk involved in repeat instrumentation. But Generally speaking, if you're if you're skilled at it and can interpret the images well, then it may increasingly be a part of the way we do these cases. Yeah, uh, I, 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 then, totally, I, totally, I, I have a comment here. I totally agree, uh, but but it, it depends if you are a trainee or if you are a, 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 a trained, because there's a lot of learning in seeing what you're doing. So I would I would actually put it the other way around. If I am doing a lot of if I'm a interventional cardiologist doing a lot of bifurcation and half of my side branches closes, then it tells me that I overdilate my stents. And then I actually suggest that just for a couple of months, use the iris and try to measure the correct size and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Because that would be the teaching part. The other thing that is important here is if you are really trained and know basically what you are doing, but things suddenly goes wrong or unexpected or became difficult, then there is a lot of gain in using imaging. It could be IVUS, it could be OCT. So use it wisely, as long as it's not the left main. The left main is another animal. Yeah, uh, if I can also share my experience, in case of difficulty, in case of some problems during the procedure, in uh, non-left main bifurcation, I think by using imaging, you can help understand what is the cause and maybe find better in this year solution. All the rest, I fully agree with both of you. And mm. uh, Dr. Kirtik is asking you, Dave, uh, would you use uh, radial for this kind of uh, one, one, one bifurcation, radial or femoral approach? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, too much evidence in favor of the radial to consider using the femoral unless there's no option to go from the radial. You, know, you don't need anything bigger than six French. Um, it's they, they can't, can't be any good rationale anymore to go from the femoral artery if the radial is accessible. 
Yeah, uh, there are a lot of I, questions. I, about I, may may I, I? I would like to comment here because one of the other reasons for promoting a provisional strategy is that you can make the most nice, complicated two-stand result with a provisional pathway due, uh, through a six French catheter. But you can't make a proper DK cross with a six French catheter. Okay, uh, the rest of the questions are at the moment mainly related to pot side pot or the role of kissing and how to do kissing. So I think we should start by showing the case, Dave, and then during the case or after the case, we can answer. And thank you very much for putting so many questions because by exchanging, I think we can all learn from this case. Okay, good. So we'll go through these uh, images one by one now. So, of course, we decided to do um, stenting, uh, and this patient was, in fact, enrolled in a clinical trial. Uh, two wires, of course, wiring the more difficult vessel first, in which, in this case, it was the diagonal. So wires in the LAD and diagonal, and then a predilatation balloon, which you can see the lesion is clearly quite narrow because uh, when we go to put the balloon in place, flow is slow. So no difficulties here. Predilate with a balloon of your choice. Could be a non-compliant balloon, could be a compliant balloon, whatever you like. I think a two and a half, 12 here. Uh, and then we look at the result. Not very surprisingly, there's good flow, slight opening of the um, area. We give some nitrate perhaps. Choose the size of the stent. Now, the stent will be chosen according to the distal diameter of the LAD here. And uh, I think in this case, it was probably a three millimeter stent, three by 18, you can see there, uh, giving enough room beyond the lesion and before the lesion to be able to do both kissing and pot. Uh, so this very straightforward first part of the procedure. Then we see the result with the uh, stented segment. Now, this is an interesting point, and this often causes anxiety and confusion because you, you can see that the ostium of the diagonal branch there is relatively tightly pinched. Flow is still Timmy 3, perhaps just about, but a lot of people think, oh, well, I better rewire and get my new wire in at this point. But of course, until you've actually done the proximal optimization, you have every chance of recrossing in the wrong place. So although it may feel a little bit um, counterintuitive, at this point, it's very important to do the pot. So you stent, then you pot, then you rewire in that order. So so the, the, the pot, I mean, I think, oh, sorry, uh, can we just show the previous slide here? Um, I think that if I'm looking at this and understand, just, just go back to the previous slide, please. If we look at the balloon position here, uh, it appears to be too proximal. Now, that may be because not both positions of the pot balloon were recorded, because, of course, you need to open the stent struts not just at the point of the bifurcation, but also back towards the very beginning of the stent. So now it may be that it wasn't all recorded, but looking at that one image, it looks as though we aren't quite up to the carina with the pot balloon. So two separate inflations of the pot balloon are, are needed here at a half a millimeter increment to the stent size in this particular case. So that I think would be a criticism and positioning of the pot balloon is, is really important to have the marker at the carina, at the takeoff of the side branch to make sure that you actually make a difference to the um, stent at the point of the bifurcation. So now we have, again, a similar result, a very tightly pinched ostium of the first, uh, sorry, second diagonal, but good flow. So this is then the point at which we rewire. Now, I don't have the recording because, of course, we don't do that every time record the actual process of the rewiring. Personally, I will leave both these wires in place, take a third wire, put it on a slight loop through the stent, 
and then come back slowly and try to recross at a relatively distal stent strut to follow the other wire now into the first diagonal. So we've now rewired and are ready to move on to the next step. So we could, we could stop at this point if we really wanted to, but I think it's a sizable diagonal and it's quite pinched and perhaps could conceivably be an angina creating uh, vessel. So we then go on to do the kissing balloon inflation. So in these cases, we take balloons that are sized appropriately for the diagonal and the LAD. So two and a half in the diagonal, three in the LAD, take them up together. We would then in my lab usually just bring these balloons back a few millimeters and do them proximally in the stented portion that is prior to the bifurcation. You could alternatively do a repeat pot. Um, and then we have a look at the result. Now, I, I think I'd, I'd like to stop at this point and ask people what they would do, because I think, I think you can see in the image on the left-hand panel that there's a very slight haziness or contrast uh, bleaching just at the ostium of the first diagonal. And mm -hmm. I think it would be reasonable to pause at this point and say, what shall we do? Have we done enough? Do we need to do more? Perfect. Dave, while you were describing the case, we received several questions. First, the role of angle in provisional. In this case, it's very narrow angle and yeah. uh, really diffuse disease at the ostium of diagonal. People yeah. ask whether you decided not to predilate because it's not part of your routine practice, or there is some specific reason why in this specific case you did not dilate. Uh, please elaborate yeah. on both angle and predilatation. Sure, yes. Yeah. So, of course, the angle is narrow, and that means that your risk of losing the side branch is higher than average, but you have a wire down in that vessel. So even in the worst case scenario that you actually do lose flow in the diagonal, you have a wire showing you where to go to rewire the vessel. So you would still do the pot and you would then attempt to rewire. So I don't think that changes your strategy at all. With regard to pre-dilatation of the side branch, um, some people do it, but really there is a danger that when you predilate the side branch, you actually cause dissection planes, which then mean that after you've put your stent in and done your pot, when you try to recross into the side branch, you go into one of those dissection planes. And then before you know it, you, you do have slow flow because you're developing a hematoma outside the vessel and you, and you run the risk of losing the vessel. So actually, you're much safer even though it looks rather narrow and it looks as though perhaps I should predilate it, you're actually much safer leaving it as it is and using that tiny channel undisturbed to pass your second wire. And, and you know, through years of experience, the European Bifurcation Club has come to that as a standard position that you're much more likely to run into trouble if you actually predilate the side branch. This is another point for uh, uh, explaining what kind of wire you use in case of difficulty to rewire in uh, this situation of a very tiny channel if you don't put it uh, I think it's a good question. I mean, I will always go with a very soft wire to start with. Uh, if I have particular trouble and I need a little bit more pushability, then I may use a slightly stronger and slippier wire uh, up as much as a, in fact, the other day I used a Gaia second to rewire a diagonal, which is really quite unusual, or perhaps something as strong as an ultimate three. But nine times out of 10, it'll be something soft and malleable to slide through the, uh, the, the ostium into position. Yeah, so first workhorse, then hydrophilic, and then stiff. Is this the yeah. sequence? Yeah. Yes. I think so. 
Excuse me. Uh, yes, anything to add to these comments? Would you do something different? Would you like to uh, add some comments? Uh, well, n not much because we are totally in line here. I was just uh, thinking when when uh, when Dave took the third wire to rewire in order to keep the the Cyprus wire as, as as a kind of a pilot. Mm. We know that this is safe because we have done the part. But if we don't do the part, the risk for the third wire to go behind the stent struts mm. is actually not ignorable. And that may hamper the entire procedure. So the pot make it totally safe to come with a new wire all the way down the LED into the stent because you will enter in the stent and not behind the stent. Because mm. some in, in, in the past, we actually used the LED wire and pulled it backwards in order to be sure that it was within the stent. And then wire and change. But then it was very, very risky to go behind the proximal stent part with the, with the diagonal wire because we didn't knew the pot at that at that time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Dave, I guess this is uh, for you. Would you consider doing IFR, FFR of the side branch in this case, or uh, you, you proceeded without doing that? No. So, and the reason we wouldn't is that um, Bon Con Ku did a lovely study where he looked at the uh, ability to tell using FFR whether something was significant or not. And uh, it was quite hard to tell angiographically. And with the FFR, which is, of course, additional expense, additional contrast, additional time, and perhaps a tiny bit of extra risk because it's not a very flexible piece of kit, um, you could find that you get answers which don't necessarily influence the patient's longer-term management. So what we learned from that study was, yes, some of the tightest-looking narrowings are, in fact, physiologically significant. What we also learned is that a lot of the tight-looking lesions actually aren't physiologically significant. And more than that, we discovered that kissing balloon inflations were safe. We know that from Nordic 3. And so in many respects, if you have a sizable branch and you have the opportunity to kiss, then really there's no penalty for doing so. And I will take that view quite commonly with a side branch that uh, appears angiographically narrowed. Yeah. Uh, may, I, may, I, may, may, may I add a, a small comment here? Because I would like again to discuss biology. And this is a, a living uh, organism we are working in. And when we manipulate the area around the uh, osteal area of the side branch, it will inevitably overdilate whatever we do a bit, which makes the sideband's osteum oval. And in some of the projections, it seems pinched, but it's not. So yeah. this is actually an, an angiographic misguiding. And if you then introduce a stiff, or more or less stiff, FFR wire in an area of that, it, it causes risk of dissection, which is totally not needed. So I totally agree with David. It's, it, there's no penalty really in, in doing the kiss, but there may also not be any uh, penalty in not doing the kiss. Sure. Because there's another, there's another thing we need to consider. And this is, if there is a slightly edema in the, in the, in the osteal area or a, a slight hematoma, or in this case, a small dissection, and we leave it, then there will be very, very easily a uh, reorganization uh, of that of that area, which actually makes at normal flow again. So there is there is actually rationale behind doing as less as possible, but not too less. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now, group of questions on how to proceed uh, next after pot and exchange of wires. We discussed type of the wire. Uh, colleagues would like to know in general. What are the indications to proceed with kissing in our cat labs? How we select balloon size and balloon type? Question is whether it's semi-compliant or non-compliant, short, one that we use as a delivery balloon for stand, and then the pressure that is used, high pressure or moderate pressure. Uh, who would like to start? And then each of us will give his personal view. Maybe Dave, because you, you did the case. Sure. Yes, sure. So which was the first question? Uh, when to do kissing in provisional. Okay. And how, yeah. in this case, 
uh, you, you decided to proceed? Yes. So I think when to do kissing in provisional is what, two things. One, the side branch has to be large enough to warrant it and large enough probably to be an angina creating vessel in, in some possibility. Uh, and secondly, there has to be some narrowing there. You don't just, for me, you don't just uh, dilate the side of the stent struts because you can. You do it because there is a narrowing that you're helping to try to fix whilst keeping access to the diagonal branch as well. So I'd have to see a sizable branch and a significant narrowing at the ostium. So those would be my two reasons. Yeah, and Giuseppe is asking beyond pot, is final kissing balloon mandatory in 110 bifurcation if you use crossover? So no lesion at the ostium uh, of the yeah, spine? No. no, not really. I mean, there's a lot of argument about this. Of course, every time you do something to your stent uh, in the side branch, you are deforming it. You then try to correct that with your kissing balloon, but you never quite correct it perfectly. So there's always a trade-off. And if there's really no disease at the ostium of the side branch and you have a nice flat grill of metal across it that's undeformed, that's probably a good situation as well. I don't like to do that in the left main because the side branch is actually a big epicardial vessel. But in other branches where there's no disease, I'm very happy to leave the stent structure across the, uh, across the ostium of the side branch. Yeah. Uh, yes, I this, yeah, yeah, well, just a comment on this again. It's never too late to give up. So if you just stop a bit too early because you think this will actually solve itself, there was no angina during the procedure, and then afterwards there comes angina, then just go in and do the kissing. Yes, sure. our, our colleague Christian has a dilemma. 2.5 millimeter plus 3 millimeter is 5.5 millimeters. Wouldn't that be a problem for the point of bifurcation with much smaller diameter, approximately 3.5? For kissing? Uh, for, for kissing? Yes. Well, yes, it, it, it may be a problem, but it definitely not always is a problem because we need to consider that, that the geometry of a bifurcation is not two tubes with, with equal diameters. This is again a tapering living organism with, with uh, an area you could call the, uh, the polygon of confluence. And the diameter in the polygon of confluence, which is actually the cross diameter exactly over the carina, is much larger than the diameter in the proximal uh, main branch. So there are rooms for these balloons. The other thing is yeah. that they actually never always go side by side, they twist like this. So, and I, and I think our, our, the person who's asked the question uh, is thinking that we'll have three and two and a half, and that'll make five and a half when the vessel is only ah, three and a half. Yeah. But, but, but actually what we're dealing with is a, a much more elastic compliant situation than that. And in fact, the size of the, uh, the kissing balloons when compressed within the artery at that size, especially a stented artery, is, is basically two D shapes next to each other. I can't really do it with my fists, but, you know, that kind of shape. So it, just, it doesn't really make five and a half millimeters. Uh, there, are, there are some bench testing measurements which were confirmed uh, recently that if you want to calculate the diameter of overlapping two balloons in the proximal part inside of the stand, 3.0 plus 2.5 will give you full diameter of the bigger one and one third of diameter of a smaller balloon. In this case, it will be three plus 0 0.8, which is around 3.8, which inside the stand is acceptable. Yeah. So that's so the easiest way. The so easiest the big way balloon to acts as a real bully. Bully yes. is a small balloon. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> which is, which is normal. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, so. anyway, this is actually an extremely important. Uh, thing to discuss because this means that most operators use two small balloons and then they didn't yes. get a proper position of the carina. They don't open the side plans in an ordinary way and they have under deployment of the proximal part of the stent. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, again, one small clarification which is I think important. Advantage of kissing over pot side pot 
is that by simultaneous inflation of two balloons, you actually position Karaina in the center of the flow. So it really works as a flow divider. And that's why uh, there is still preference of the club in favor of pot key spot instead of pot side inflation and pot. I don't know if two of you agree or you want to comment on that. Yes, I'd like to comment. I think pot side pot uh, might work on the bench when you can decide exactly where to put the final pot balloon. But in practice, clinically, you're quite likely to miss by a millimeter or two. And if you do that, then all you've achieved is make sure that the part of the stent that's been bowed in towards the main vessel from the side branch simply stays there. So you've unnecessarily uh, undone some of your hard work. I really don't agree with pot side pot at all. I think it's lazy. And I think a proper kissing inflation is far superior. And for the sequence of inflation and deflation, is there a certain rule that we need to follow? You start one or you start simultaneously, deflate simultaneously. And also there are multiple questions on the pressure that you use. Is it high pressure or moderate? Uh, please help uh, discuss that one. Well, shall I say what I do? Uh, what yes. I do is I is I like to I, I like to watch what's happening and see if we're getting opening. So, for example, we're partly doing it because of the narrowing of the ostium of the side branch. So, I will particularly be interested in what that balloon is doing at the ostium of the side branch. So, I will go up with both. This is in a single stent strategy. I will go up with both together. But if I need a little bit more pressure in the balloon that's in the side branch to make sure it actually opens properly i may go up so initially i will usually try eight or something relatively modest in both balloons but then if i need more in the side balloon i'll go up 12 16 if necessary but you are trying not to damage or split or dissect that part of the vessel and you are using compliant balloons to avoid that so so i think but i think there's no um, absolute rule here. You 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 do what's needed to make sure that you've actually dilated the area in the same way as you would with uh, a, a de novo lesion. Okay. So, uh, to to summarize on the kissing, so we try to uh, select short, preferably non-compliant balloons. Try to limit proximal overlap and use moderate pressure with alternate or sequential inflation longer inflation time, if possibly, to keep it 20 or 30 seconds, and then simultaneous deflation. Am I right? Absolutely. And, uh, uh, Dave, there is a specific question for you from Armin. Sorry, David, according to your comment, you always do kissing in provisional in left main. Is it mandatory? Is there any precise data about it? No, it's not mandatory and there's no precise data. And I wouldn't say always. I would just say that as a general rule, I think the left main is slightly different in this respect. And you have to have a lower threshold for considering doing a kiss rather than leaving uh, a, a total crossover. Yeah, uh, there is a comment also from Mauricio that I think it's a, a very good comment. Uh, this diagonal branch is significant and uh, its length is greater than 73 and there is a CT scan analysis showing that the predictor of the vessel diameter uh, is a vessel length of 73 is a cutoff for supplying 10% of myocardial mass. And this is why we consider certain branches clinically relevant based on the work of Hashamovic from 2000, that only branches which supply more than 10% of myocardial mass should be revascularized because they impact on patient prognosis. Uh, because of this specific anatomy, in case you need second stand, Dave, what would be your strategy? And there is also another question. There is haziness at the ostium of diagonal. How you decide when to proceed with second stand and when to stop? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. And I think it's just a question of judgment and working out whether you think there's any 
chance that the vessel will actually close. So if it's a very localized type A dissection, you may choose to leave it. The results from Nordic 1 were amazing, considering what was left at the time. Um, and at the same time, you know, increasingly the trend would be not to leave the artery as we left it. Um, but the problem with that is that although there are some good results from some centers with two stent techniques, inevitably, the more instrumentation, the more metal work, the more there is risk, of course, of procedural complications in stem restenosis, stem thrombosis. It can't be less. It has to be more. So um, I think you have to do it based on your judgment. Uh, in this case, for me, if we had decided to put in a second stent, it would be a, a mini culotte. Um, I think you could, you could possibly try a tap, but the angles are such that you'd probably have a bit too much overlap into the uh, hanging in the breeze, as it were, in the main vessel. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any comment or we should review the follow-up result? I'm really curious to see what was the patient outcome in this case. Uh, yeah, I don't have more comments at, at this stage. It, it has been excellent discussion until now. Okay, so Dave, show us the follow-up result, and then we go to a few most important pitfalls, which will be, by the way, the topic for our next consensus document. And I'm happy to share with you that Jens Lassen will lead the team. So if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, send him your comments, and we'll try to incorporate those comments. Yes, yeah, so interestingly, this guy came back for a further angiogram five years later. He had, in fact, been in the EBC2 trial. Uh, and for atypical chest pain, he came for a further angiogram later. And actually, interestingly, you can see just what Jens was alluding to, which was that actually uh, the brilliance of the human body has triumphed despite our best efforts. And uh, actually, the result at the origin of the side branch is much better than when we left it. That very small dissection has evaporated. The the area of the ostrum, the diagonal, has remodeled. Flow is excellent. Uh, you might not even know that that had been previously touched. So that's an interesting anecdotal, but I think it's definitely worth viewing because often trainees don't get that um, linear perspective through time to see these kind of results coming five years later. You know, you have to have a, a long career and be as grizzled as me before you see these things and, and, and recognize them for the amazing thing that they are with the human body. But so this was the result. It was interesting to see the, the outcomes and often the outcomes with a simple strategy and a kiss into the side branch are remarkably good. I think it's a great, and I really congratulate on fantastic result. Uh, one of the points that I think we should uh, share is if you are uh, uh, ready to accept uh, angiographically partially suboptimal result, but with timetry yeah. and with residual stenosis less than 50%, all that we learned from all prior studies is that provisional has a very good long-term outcome if you finish procedure with less than 50% and with timetry flow. So these two are important, but of course it will always look nicer if you put second stand. But nicer does not mean better clinical and follow-up uh, if you do angio. Uh, uh, Dave, uh, do, you, do you agree? I couldn't agree more. I think it's perfectly expressed. Yeah. And there is a current vogue for getting the aesthetically pleasing result of a two-stent strategy. But, you know, there, there are inevitably prices to pay for having put a second stent in. Yeah. Uh, Dave, two more questions related to this case, and then we should uh, go to pitfalls. Is middle diagonal stenosis significant? And second question, duration of DAPT after provisional and after two-stand strategy, what is the current practice? I mean, I must say I do the same whether it's a two-stand strategy or not, and I don't know whether I should consider changing that. We tend to give six months of dual antiplatelet therapy. There's 
plays and counterplays with this. Of course, the 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 longer you give the DAPT, the less the chances of uh, uh, MI and revascularization, but the greater the chances of bleeding. So you know, you, <laughs> it's always a balance between the two. You rob yeah. Peter to pay Paul, and I, I don't think anyone knows the definite answer. Exactly. Actually, we exchanged opinion with. Uh, uh, several uh, key opinion leaders from the uh, world and Marco Zimarino put uh, everything in the white paper on duration of antiplatelet therapy in bifurcation and it was recently published in Euro Intervention and I really kindly invite all of you uh, to go read it, understand the current position and remaining dilemmas. Uh, yes, should we go now to see what are the most common pitfalls on the last TBC meeting, you were uh, the leader of the session on pitfalls, and please share. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Goran. And again, I think this this case was actually excellent, and and we have all already touched to some of the uh, the, uh, the 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 problem that can occur during the procedure. Uh, pitfalls of pot. Uh, we have addressed two, three, and four a bit, so I think we should go further on to the next slide. This is actually out of the uh, newly published uh, 15th consensus document from the European Bifurcation Club. And it shows exactly what we are facing when we are doing the ballooning with a second shorter balloon to open up towards the side brands. And one of the things that we see is in the, in the far right that if we actually bring in the pot balloon too long away from the carina, we will have a geographical miss in the proximal part, and we will actually not open stent struts up too much in the distal part. If we, on the other hand, go to the far left and do the pot too deep, we actually ruin the whole procedure because what we did when we inserted the stent before the pot was to implant it with respect to the distal diameter. And if we go too deep with the pot balloon, we actually again pushes the uh, carina towards the side brands and maybe also misses uh, or are missing the proximal part of the stent, introducing what we could call a bottleneck. So this actually tells us that why, uh, that balloon position is extremely important if the parts need to be done correctly, which also me means that the angle of the X-ray uh, 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 is extremely important to have a uh, uh, a fully open angle between the two branches, as you can see in the middle part of this cartoon. Next slide, please. This is actually what happens. This is a bench test by uh, Nils Holm's group and done with, in, in collaboration with John Ormiston, showing us that if we put too, do, too deep after a tap, then we will actually just push the opened metallic carina towards the side branch and close it again. This is very well depicted in these two, uh, in these two micro CT areas, showing it from A5 to A6 on your right, that you're actually pushing the carina back. So this is a pitfall, and you need to be aware of it because it's not totally obvious if you do it by angio. The only way to solve it is actually to go in and do a new kiss and correct for the, uh, the malposition. And this brings me further on to the next discussion because David showed us so nicely in the case that it's easy to actually use the pot balloon in the wrong place. It's uh, one millimeter is enough. So if we do pot side pot, you need to be extremely precise with the second pot. Otherwise you just close to the side plans. But if you do kissing and you have an overlap up in the, the, not too much, but just an overlap up in the proximal part of the main branch. Then there's room for the pot balloon to be a few millimeters above the carina and avoid pushing the carina towards the side branch. So again, this is one of the things that you need to consider when you choose your balloon size. And uh, when you actually place the first stent in the provisional pathway, because you need to have room proximal for, for the uh, takeoff of the side brands, enough to have room for a balloon, which means for most practical issues, at least eight millimeters of stent. Otherwise, 
you won't have a balloon that would be able to, to cover it if it's only six. Next slide, please. So the stepwise provisional strategy, I, I guess we have discussed it a bit. So uh, the point to note yeah, yeah. is, as yeah, we have yes. discussed, yeah. Yeah, before we finalize uh, the steps, uh, there are a few more questions specifically related okay. to thought that I would like to answer, to both of you to answer. Uh, first question is how you select the type of balloon, the diameter and length of the pot balloon, and is it always non-compliant or it's also possible to use compliant balloons? So how do you select the size? And uh, is it important to be compliant, non-compliant? Did you hear that, Jens? <laughs> yeah, but I was just polite to letting you answer. But no, I've, no, I've answered too much already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, there are, of course, options with, every, with everything here. A compliant balloon, uh, it, it's difficult to control the diameter totally in, over the entire length of the stent because if there is an airing that is actually maybe a calcium fight plaque or whatever, which is difficult to, to crack, you will maybe overdilate in the, in, in the non-calcified areas. But using a, a non-compliant balloon, you can control the pressure and you can control the diameter. So that's the reason for actually uh, uh, pushing the use of uh, non-compliant balloon forwards. There is a theore theoretical uh, 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 issue also with a compliant balloon because there might be a bit more recoil when you use a compliant balloon. Yeah. So that, uh, that would question, actually. Question for Dave. Dave, uh, do you keep jailed wire uh, during pot balloon inflation? And what kind of the jailed wire you select? Very good question. Very commonly <laughs> asked, very commonly misunderstood. Yes, absolutely. You keep the jailed wire in position until you've done everything that you think you need to do with the pot balloon. So don't be afraid. If you need to take it to 20, 24 atmospheres, that's what you need to do. You need to expand it fully so that when you go with your new wire, you don't go behind the stent struts. So yes, absolutely, you must leave the wire there. The type of wire you use is up to you. Personally, I use a non-hydrophilic wire because that's my workhorse wire. If you're worried about a vessel, you will find that a hydrophilic wire slips out easier, probably leaves a little bit of its polymer jacket coat behind. But I so so both types of wire are perfectly acceptable. Okay. Dave, I think you should have privilege to conclude what is a stepwise provisional. So if we can go to the next slide, and Dave, please conclude before okay. I close the session. Next slide, please. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I think you know there's it, it's interesting because for 15 years there was not really much disagreement about this about the stepwise provisional strategy, but I think the uh, advent of the enthusiasts of the D DK Crush and some of the results coming from China with DK Crush have meant that the approach has been challenged more than before. And so I think the club should and does reiterate its position, which is that the beauty of the provisional approach, as it's called, is that it's a stepwise and layered approach which allows you to look at each stage and decide is what I've done enough? Uh, and if it is, it is not enough, do I need to do something more? Uh, do I have the option to stop where I am? So it's a stepwise and provisional strategy. It's logical and straightforward. It is essentially pretty much the same. Your approach to bifurcation can pretty much always be successful with a provisional approach to the to the side to the uh, bifurcation it's entirely reproducible and because it's applicable to nearly all anatomical circumstances it is a highly versatile technique in contrast to many techniques which require you to decide up front what you're doing and as Jens beautifully has put it if you start with one stent, then you can, of course, end up with two. But if you start with two stents, you can't end up with one. So 
the provisional strategy is something which we like to talk through in exactly the way we've done with the case we showed today. And you decide when to stop. It's not predetermined. You you do each step, and after each step, you have another think and go, okay, is that a good result? Do we need to do more, or do we stop here? And that means that you haven't prejudged the issue, you haven't decided at the outset exactly how it's going to behave during the case. And that means that you have uh, a very versatile, highly logical, stepwise approach to bifurcations, which will stand you in very good stead as an interventionist. And actually, the outcomes when you look at the trials uh, over the 10 years from the UK and the Nordic groups in particular uh, have really been excellent. And you will hardly ever uh, find that you have regretted taking this approach to a bifurcation. It will stand you in very, very good stead. Thank you very, very much, both of you. I really enjoyed immensely discussing with you. So next slide, please. I would like to thank both of you. I would like to thank our participants. I think we can conclude that provisional is recommended for majority. It translates into sequential decision-making. Pot is mandatory and kissing is optional in provisional. Uh, I would like, next slide, I would like to invite all of you to our next webinar on Monday, 16th of November, 1 p.m. Central European time. We will have excellent faculty and discuss how should I treat left main stenosis, focus on the stand technique. I thank you all. I thank the Metronic for kindly supporting this series of bifurcation webinars. And I hope to see you soon. Please send your questions, comments. We would like to improve and we really need your feedback to do it. Have a nice day and thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.